This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, happy holidays. And by that I mean, I am now on holidays and I am happy. This week I jet off for a four week vacation with my family. It's the first family getaway we've done since the plague struck. So we're all pretty looking forward to it. It does mean a few things for this channel. Number one, we're actually gonna be taking a break from this week in games for this month. I'd earlier said that this show would keep on going and I'd keep recording it while I was on holiday, but I thought about that some more and I'm like, you know what? No, I think I have a natural inclination to just work all the time. That's generally what it's like being a content creator. So my brain kind of autopiloted to the idea of, yeah, I can keep working on my holidays, sure. But thinking about it more deeply, I've been running pretty hot since January of this year, and it's only gonna get worse when I get back with Atlas Fallen, Armored Core, Starfield, Lies of Peace, Cyberpunk, Phantom Liberty, Assassin's Creed Mirage, Lords of the Fallen, Alloway 2, Spider-Man 2, Avatar, and of course, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. I want to get my elephant on. Point is, taking a break is a good thing, and that's what I'm going to do. So, no new show for the next few weeks. You can expect the next one to go live on around August 8th. It also means that I won't be doing any reviews this month. To be honest, I kind of picked a good month for vacation, since July is very lean. They don't call it dry July for nothing. Having said that, there is Exo Primal and Remnant 2 dropping, and rather than just skip those two entirely, I've actually asked Austin to step in and step up. He's going to be reviewing those games on this channel instead. For anyone that doesn't know, Austin actually has a background in games development. He has his own YouTube channel focused on Guild Wars 2, and he's also just cool and smart and insightful. I really like talking to him about games, and I think you'll enjoy hearing his takes on them. His first review will be for Exo Primal next week, so be sure to show him some love when all that happens. All right, that's pretty much all the housekeeping done, so uh, let's get this show on the road, shall we? Sega's had a pretty interesting year in the headlines, hasn't it? From the revival of the Sonic IP in both 2D, 3D, and movie form, to the rumors of it being a acquired by Microsoft to, well, other things which we'll discuss later in the episode, Sega has been pretty front of mind. One thing that generated a lot of chatter a while back was they're hyping up something called a super game. That wasn't its name, mind you. It was more of a descriptor for some ambitious thing they were working on that, in all honesty, just sounded like a new way to shoehorn in NFTs, blockchain, and pay to earn. This initiative was revealed at a time when NFTs were all the rage, with publishers like EA declaring that they were the future of the video games industry. But it is so funny how much money you can get paid to say dumb shit if you're a CEO. Anyway, Sega looked like it was heading down this ruinous path, but since the bottom has fallen out of the NFT market, once you know it, Sega's now got no interest in pay to earn games, declaring them boring. Yeah, no fucking shit. Funny how you only came to that conclusion after you realized there was no money in it. Speaking of Bloomberg, Sega's chief operating officer, Shuji Yutsumi, said that the company plans to abandon all of its blockchain game development, saying, quote, the action in play to earn games is boring. What's the point if games are no fun, end quote. Oh my God, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills listening to these people talk, parroting back the same points that we made to them two years ago, while they all tried to gaslight us into this blockchain hellscape. He went on talking about the Super Game Initiative, which was due to kick off in 2026, musing that it may not include any of the Web3 stuff that the initiative was basically based on. Quote, we're looking into whether this technology is really going to take off in this industry after all, end quote. Let me tell you right now, buddy, it ain't gonna take off. So get to work on an Altered Beast reboot or something and stop wasting our time with this nonsense. It almost feels comical to pivot to this next story after that last one, but wouldn't you know it, Ubisoft have just announced a new NFT game. Man, you couldn't credit it if it wasn't true, but no word of a lie, in the year of our Lord 2023, Ubisoft thought it would be a good idea to announce an NFT game powered by some fucking garbage blockchain network thing. I honestly don't care enough to look up the name of it. The game itself is called Champions Tactics Grimoria Chronicles, and it had probably the quietest reveal of any Ubisoft product ever. They actually didn't put up the reveal trailer on their own YouTube channel, putting it up instead on some newly created channel that has 172 subscribers, all of them NFT bots, of course. The teaser trailer gives away no actual information about the game, which is pretty on point for anything on the blockchain, since playability is rather incidental to the whole affair. These experiences are proxy financial vehicles only, houses of cards built on rugs that will always, always get pulled at some point. Anyway, that's the game. I'll leave a link to the reveal trailer below 
so you can click on the dislike button. All right, pivoting back to Sega now. In that top block, I mentioned that Sega was in the headlines for a number of reasons this year, and one of the more unfortunate ones was the fate of one of its most famed creators, Yuji Naka. This man was one of the co-creators of Sonic, Sega mascot who would challenge Mario by doing all the things that Nintendo don't. More recently, Sonic had a big resurgence owing to some solid 2D outings, a much loved 3D Sonic, and two wildly successful movies, both of which pulled in way more money than anyone at Sega or the movie studios were expecting. Naka did didn't see a dime of that money though, as he's recently been in an acrimonious relationship with Square Enix where he developed the much lauded, sorry, I meant much laughed at, Balan Wonderworld Land. One of the worst 3D platformers ever made, and man, if you lived through the PS1 era, you would know that's some steep criticism. Anyway, while Naka was working at Square, he got some inside information that they were about to announce a mobile title. So Naka and his mates bought shares in the game's developer before this announcement was public. Now, if Naka was a member of the US Congress, then that action would be all fine and dandy, but he's not. He's a private Japanese citizen, and what he did was a clear act of insider trading. Naka was caught and quickly confessed to the crime. He was convicted guilty, and this week his sentence was handed down, 30 months in prison. However, the sentence has been suspended, so he won't serve any time unless he engages in more insider trading. Let's hope he doesn't do that. He also has to pay a fine of 173 million yen, or roughly 1.2 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. Let's hope the Sonic years were good to Naka. So yeah, that's the end of that chapter for now. A sad end to a man who, for all his faults, still left an indelible mark on the gaming landscape. I'm talking, of course, about Balan Wonderworld but also Sonic, I guess. While we're on the topic of corruption, did you guys hear about this Korean ratings board story? This is fucking wild. Okay, so like most countries in the world, Korea has an agency whose job it is to rate video games. This one's okay for everyone. This one's for teenagers that are above only. This one is banned because someone smoked some weed in it and got a stat buff. Oh wait, sorry, that's Australia. Thankfully, no other agency is that dumb. Anyway, the Koreans rating board recently rated a game called Blue Archive and they rated it 18 plus due to perceived graphic content in the game. Pretty standard stuff, right? Well, the game's players didn't agree with this assessment, deeming it too harsh, and so they banded together to get a petition going, and that petition got some 5,400 signatures. That was enough to trigger an investigation into the matter, which also led to an audit of the agency, and what was found was pretty crazy. Apparently, the people running this place have been embezzling hundreds of thousands of dollars and using it to fund a Bitcoin mining operation, while also falsifying multiple documents and just generally mismanaging the entire operation. This has led to a wave of resignations at the agency, which is now all but effectively crippled by the absence of senior leaders, and Korean politicians have promised to completely overhaul the agency in light of these findings. So, the moral of the story is, don't get between a gacha fan and their fan service. They will fuck you up and the agency you work for. You know who isn't corrupt? Nintendo. Sure, they'll sue a Girl Scout if she happens to bake a cookie that looks a little bit like Mario's head, but corrupt? Probably not. Or at least they're a hell of a lot less corrupt than your average video game executive, as evidenced by their very modest and very reasonable salaries. Nintendo lists the income of its top five earners, and you see here that CEO Shuntaro Furukawa earns 2.5 million US dollars a year. What's an American game CEO earning by contrast? Well, EA's CEO Andrew Wilson took home some $20 million last year. And that was a light year for him because before then, he took home nearly $40 million the year prior. Sounds pretty gross? Well, I hope you're not eating right now because in 2021, Activision CEO Bobby Kotick took home nearly $154 million in a single year. And you have old mate Shigeru Miyamoto out here earning $2 million a year in the same year that he put out the Mario movie that made over a billion bucks. That's what they call the Pratt effect, by the way. Inspired casting choice by Miyamoto, Chris Pratt, man. He's just, he's just so cool. Anyway, the point of this block is to say that most CEOs are gluttonous swine, while Nintendo's execs seem to be keeping it real. Respect for that. Staying in Japan for a touch longer, Capcom has said they're interested in bringing back both Onimusha and Mega Man. Maybe, sort of, a little bit. Onimusha, for those unawares, was a samurai survival horror game that went extremely hard. And frankly, it's a crime the series hasn't had a remake or a revival in the same way that Resident Evil has and Dino Crisis deserves. Mega Man is, well, it's Mega Man, but that audience has been serviced at least a little bit by a wave of re-released classic titles, but no new entries for a long last time. And no, Mighty Number no. 9 definitely does not count. The news comes from a recent investor Q&A when someone asked about a bunch of old Capcom titles, including Onimusha, and the executive really only said that they were having discussions about those titles without being too specific. 
about which title he was referring to. On the topic of Mega Man, the response was more pointed. Quote, we are considering how to approach the production of new entries in the series, which requires numerous factors, including the development of solid concepts, ideas, and gameplay, end quote. That's pretty definitive and certainly indicates that Capcom are at least strongly considering this one. The wording indicates that if anything is cooking though, it certainly won't be coming anytime soon. In the same Q&A, we got brief mention of potential Resident Evil spin-offs like Code Veronica or Revelations, with Veronica in particular being a much requested remake. All Capcom would say on the matter is that they are carrying out discussions, but offered no more specifics. Still, at least they didn't rule it out, right? And to be honest, they've got to do Veronica. What are they going to do? Remake five and six? Come on, we all know that's not going to happen as much as we'd all love to see how they handle the boulder punching scene with the latest cutting edge visuals and Chris's new hot dad character model. You thought Google was done with Stadia? Well, thankfully you are correct, but that doesn't mean that Google has given up on the gaming segment entirely. Last week, the Wall Street Journal revealed that Google are currently testing a new tool that will allow you to instantly play games through YouTube. It's called Playables, and right now the game being tested is called Stack Bounce, which is a casual arcade game. This ability to play games through YouTube is one of the key promised but undelivered selling points for Stadia. The idea being that you could see a game trailer or a review for a game and then with one click immediately begin playing that game in YouTube through the cloud. It was a fantastic idea and had it been delivered, Stadia may well be here today. But it wasn't delivered, and Stadia is now defunct, delisted, and deleted. Living on is only another entry in that killedbygoogle.com website. Does this new internal test hint at a revival of this promised feature? Maybe, but if it does emerge as a consumer-facing product, it'll almost certainly be a service that YouTube provides to other publishers and platforms, rather than being something that directs people towards Google's publishing efforts, as Stadia was intending. Big missed opportunity for Google, but if this feature does roll out and other publishers do adopt it, I think it's going to be a bit of a game changer, to be honest. So I certainly hope that Google can deliver a red W on this one. Okay, time for something a little different. Very often I'll go hands on with stuff, but I won't have enough to say on it to justify a dedicated video. However, I still want to say something about it because I really liked it. I thought rather than just letting that stuff die as a throwaway tweet or whatever, we can start doing a little bit of hands on coverage here during this show and just see how it sticks. And what better game to kick things off than Hot Wheels Unleashed 2? I got to play this while I was at the Summer Games Fest in LA. I spent about 45 minutes with it, being led through by the lead gameplay designer, who also worked on the previous game. I started the session by being like, dude, good job on the last one, congrats. Hot Wheels Unleashed was this sleeper hit that no one saw coming. I expected to play like 15 minutes of it on a whim, but it ended up being such a competently put together arcade racer that I ended up dumping a bunch of hours into it, including after I was done with my review. Link to that review below the like button, by the way. So this is Hot Wheels 2. The footage you're seeing here was captured by me, and yep, I crash into the walls a lot. No sugarcoating it. Hot Wheels is accessible, but it's also deep in a way that it controls, rewarding the sort of mastery that I clearly did not have if this footage is anything to go by. I asked the developer, so what's new this time around? Since Hot Wheels 2 definitely looks a lot like the first, visually it's pretty indistinguishable, which isn't inherently a bad thing since the previous one only came out a short time ago. And besides, this one still looks great. The new hotness is all the new features since Hot Wheels 2 adds things like a jump, double jump and dodge to almost every vehicle. The jump is actually a really big deal, allowing you to find new shortcuts or avoid obstacles with ease. And some of the new obstacles have been designed with the jump in mind. The side dodge is great for not only last minute hazard avoidance, but can also be used to give other racers a gentle nudge this way or that if you think it'll help knock them off the track. The other big feature is a skill unlock system that unlocks for every car, allowing you to unlock new tailored bonuses for your favorite Hot Wheels. It's similar to something like Forza Horizon, works great there, no doubt it'll work great here too. There's other stuff like the inclusion of motorcycles and ATVs, there's new locations, new game modes, and even more stuff in the track creation tool, which was always a real highlight of the first game. It's just more Hot Wheels, but better and cooler, and I'm down for it because Hot Wheels rules, it truly does. This one is out on October 19th for all platforms, and yeah, that is the end of the very first hands-on preview block in This Week in Video Games. Let me know what you guys think of all this in the comments below. A quick lightning round to finish off. You've heard of a Dutch oven, but how about a Dutch loot box? <laughs> Was that anything? Did that joke make any sense at all? I don't I don't think it did. This week, the Dutch government confirmed that they are planning to ban loot boxes entirely. These are already regulated in the Netherlands, but an outright ban would be an aggressive and frankly excellent new step. It won't mean much in the big scheme of things as publishers will continue to do what they're already doing, not releasing loot box games in the Netherlands. But hopefully this move serves as a beachhead that other nations can use in their fight against this insidious form of in-game monetization. Many other European countries are eyeing a loot box ban, and if the entire 
entire EU block were to ban loot boxes, then you better bet publishers will start changing things up. And can you imagine if EA couldn't sell FIFA in Europe? That will be so funny. Please let that happen. A Rainbow Six Siege player who's been banned nearly 80 times for hacking has been sentenced to three years of community service. It's not for the hacking though, it's for a raft of offenses, including a DDoS attack on a French government official, another DDoS attack on Minecraft developer Mojang, and oh yeah, he also swatted the offices of Ubisoft Montreal, resulting in a tactical unit being dispatched and employees barricading themselves in their offices. Personally, three years community service sounds a little light to me. If Yuji Naka can cop that sort of punishment for just buying shares, sounds like this dude got off very light indeed. Something tells me that community service won't be the thing that sets this guy on the straight and narrow. If you are hoping that IDOS Montreal were secretly working on a new Deus Ex game, then keep hoping because they probably aren't. Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. The latest reminder on all this came from Adam Jensen's voice actor, Elias Tufexis. He responded to a fan asking him whether or not he was working on a new Deus Ex game in secret. And Tufexis responded, quote, Yeah, as happy as I am to be busy, I wish I was even more busy on a new Deus Ex. I'm not under any NDA for Deus Ex because no one has called me about it. Truly. End quote. That's a bummer, but there's also been some chatter that IDOS are planning to return to Deus Ex in the future after their next title ships. So if that's true, then the game is likely in pre-production at the moment and wouldn't need voice talent yet. So yeah, don't count Deus Ex out just yet. Finally, if you want to know why Nintendo are dragging their feet on a successor to the Nintendo Switch, I'll tell you why. This month, with the console over six years old, it just had its best ever month of sales in Japan. Nikkei is reporting that in Japan, the Switch sold 380,000 units, an increase of 68% versus last year. Six years into this product's life cycle, and it is still selling like hotcakes. The demand was pushed up by Zelda, which has the longest legs of any game this year, as well as a Nintendo Direct where a bunch of new Mario games were announced. A new Switch console is on the way, but with numbers like these, you can understand why Nintendo are in absolutely no hurry at all to get it out the door. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, not a whole lot to be honest. This is one of the quietest weeks of news I've seen in a while. I say that now, but surely between the time when I've recorded this episode and when it's gone live, Microsoft has purchased Hideo Kojima for $40 billion. Not his company, mind you, just him. It's a whole new acquisition strategy for Microsoft. And I'm gonna get in trouble for that joke, aren't I? Moving right along, upcoming roguelike first-person shooter Dead Link did get a release date this week, July 27th. This is one that I've shouted out previously in my Put This On Your Radar segment. It's a visually striking, very smooth and very satisfying shooter that did the rounds previously as part of a Steam Next Fest and it emerged as one of the big winners. Visuals and gunplay felt like they were punching well above their weight. It was an early access that kicked off in October of last year and it's gone down a treat with the game sitting at very positive on Steam. That 1.0 release date makes this a bit of a surefire bet. There aren't too many shooters coming out for the rest of the year and along with the likes of Trepang Squared and Turbo Ultra Kill, the indie scene is definitely hard carrying the shooter category this year. For real, take a look at Deadlink if you get a chance, I promise you won't be disappointed. Here's something pretty cool, Return to Monkey Island is headed to mobile devices on July 27th. Listen, this is a great video game, it just is. You don't need to have played the previous entries though it does help. It's a very funny, smartly written point and click adventure game with the added benefit of feeling quite modern since all of the more frustrating design elements that defined the original games have been ironed out here. I really loved this when I played it last year, link to my review below the like button. If you want a cheeky chuckle and smirk on the bus ride to work, you could do a hell of a lot worse than this. Seasonal announcement. I don't often do this, but Diablo 4 seems to have kept a lot of its launch momentum, so it feels right. This week, Blizzard announced that Season 1 of Diablo 4 will begin on July 20th for all platforms. It's called Season of the Malignant and includes new story beats, new gems called Malignant Hearts that augment your builds in crazy ways, new bosses to fight, and of course, plenty of new items to collect. The backbone of the update is a battle pass with both a free and paid track, with the paid track providing cosmetics only. It's a standard live service fare, but to be honest, I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually still playing Diablo. I just hit World Tier 4 at level 57, and let me tell you, that capstone dungeon was not easy at that level. I'm mopping up the map and planning on maxing out my druid, and I'm low-key thinking about taking a break from Destiny to play more Diablo, in part because there's not much cooking in Destiny right now, and in part because I'm just really loving Diablo, to be honest. If you are too, then like I said, the new season launches on July 20th. No delay announcements this week, but there was one game cancellation, Just Cause Mobile. Bet you didn't know that was in development. Well, neither did I until I saw a headline saying it got cancelled. Apparently this was announced at the Game Awards back in 2020, but who the hell remembers that, man? I mean, I've gone up two jean sizes since then. 
Funny thing is, this game was already basically finished and was soft launched into a bunch of markets. But Square suddenly pulled the rug, delisting the game from storefronts, announcing that development will cease and that any purchases made to this point will be refunded. Not quite sure what happened here, but there you have it. Good news though, a Just Cause movie is still apparently on the way, with John Wick creator Derek Kolstad apparently on board to write the script. To be honest, I would have thought that a Just Cause movie sounded like the dumbest thing ever, but if anyone can get us interested in a movie where the explosions are more important than the actors, it's probably the guy that wrote John Wick. Him or Vin Diesel, either one. So what came out last week? Well, not a lot, and we actually covered off one of them last week since reviews had already lifted for VR shooter Synapse. TLDR, it's very solid, and setting aside the dearth of VR content available for your PSVR 2, this would still be a worthy shooter backed up by some strong voice talent. The other release last week was for The Legend of Heroes Trails into Reverie, which hit the PlayStation Switch and PC. Only a few Steam reviews up for this one at the time of recording, but it's already sitting at an extremely impressive 97% very positive. Critics were also quite impressed, putting it at a strong 80 on Open Critic. Eurogamer scored this one 4 out of 5 stars and said, quote, Trails into Reverie is a fine epilogue for Crossbell and Cold Steel arcs, offering necessary closure and clear hints about the series' future, end quote. And IGN were in about the same spot, scoring it an 8 and saying, quote, The Legend of Heroes Trails into Reverie has a great story with an engaging turn-based battle system. While it does have issues with a bloated cast of characters, impeccable pacing makes every interaction manageable, end quote. Just a reminder that this one is a conclusion to a story arc, so make sure you check out the preceding entries before jumping into this one. And that was the week that was, so what's coming out this week? A few interesting things actually, like Mordhau for consoles. And that really snuck up, didn't it? I mean, if you asked me if Mordhau was out on consoles already, I'd have been like, yeah, for two years, you idiot. But I would have been the idiot, because while Mordhau released back in 2019 on PC, it's only this week coming to consoles. Pretty crazy. If you missed it, Mordhau was that game that came along and ate Chivalry's lunch while we were all waiting for Chivalry 2. It's one of those medieval brawlers with a focus on dismemberment and shenanigans. Not great for those with a weak stomach or a YouTube channel, since YouTube demonetizes anything that gory. But it's a hell of a good time, especially if you can wrangle in some mates. This one's hitting current and last gen PlayStation and Xbox consoles on the 12th. Oxenfree 2 Lost Signals is another one that seems to have snuck up on us actually. The first game was a charming adventure mystery that had kind of some Stranger Things energy without looking like it was aping the source material. Netflix obviously agree with that assessment, offering to fund the development of a sequel, and here it is. Oxenfree 2 is hitting all platforms on the 12th, and if you have a Netflix subscription, you can actually play this one on your phone by downloading the game through the Netflix client. Jagged Alliance is back after a nearly quarter century hiatus. Sure, there have been other Jagged Alliance games since 1999's Jagged Alliance 2, but Jagged Alliance 3 has been stuck in both legal and development hell as far back as 2000. The rights being fought over and development being passed like a football between different studios until the license was abandoned and a game called Hired Guns The Jagged Edge went out instead. THQ Nordic picked up the rights to Jagged Alliance back in 2015 and since then have been slowly working towards the release of this official numbered entry. Jagged Alliance 3 is that position focused tactical combat that the series has always been famous for as well as plenty of equipment and character customization to make sure you're bringing the right squad to the job. It's nice to see the series back after so long on the bench and if you want to grab it it's coming exclusively to PC on the 14th. Biggest release of the week is, oh boy, where to begin with this one? Exoprimal. Now to be clear, I am firmly in Exoprimal's camp. I am an Exoprimal enjoyer. I am there in the front row waving a little dinosaur flag and wearing oversized dinosaur merch. Okay, that's me, but I'm not gonna lie. I have my doubts about this one. Exoprimal is very, very weird. It's a co-op dinosaur shooter where dinosaurs rain from the heavens like a reptilian waterfall, and you and your squad of mecked up bros need to make sure the dinosaurs keep falling after that initial descent. What complicates this is that you're not actually fighting dinosaurs at all. You're fighting simulated dinosaurs spun up by a nefarious AI who pits you against another team of fighters to see who can kill more simulated dinosaurs first, and at the end of it all, it makes the two teams fight each other. If it sounds weird, it's because it's absolutely batshit insane, but it is fun, I'll tell you that. I've played two betas now and enjoyed both of them. The problem is that this game needs a thriving player base in order to sustain it, and with so many live service games vying for attention, I'd be really surprised if this one is able to go the distance beyond that launch window. I'm hoping I'm wrong, because Capcom are on a huge winning streak these past few years, and it's risky business betting against them. Plus, this is also coming to Game Pass, which definitely helps bolster numbers, given that, yeah, I suspect it'll need a little bolstering. If you're keen to take a punt on something very weird and very different, then Exoprimal launches on the 14th for all platforms bar the Switch. Expect a review from Austin a little while after launch. All right, time for a trip down memory lane, sort of, so put this on your radar.
Remember that Star Fox game a little while ago? No, not the actual Star Wars game on the Wii U that everyone hated. I'm talking about Exodiac, an indie title that was loving homage to the classic Nintendo 64 shooter. Exodiac essentially asked, what if you could go back and do it again? But Whisker Squadron from independent developer Flipfly asks, what would this genre look and play like in the modern era? The answer is this, and it looks pretty damn good. It's got a simple but effective cartoonish aesthetic that captures the yesteryear charm while still looking detailed and modern. The action plays out in linear, narrow spaces, but also in more open plan 3D environments. Interestingly, it's got some roguelike elements in there too, with the ability to spend XP earned to upgrade your ship, making future runs easier and different since this is a run-based game with procedural elements. I think this is a neat looking package. It definitely caught my eye when someone shot me a link to it earlier this week. I've already added this to my wish list in anticipation of a planned 2024 release. If you'd like to do the same, then I've profiled it over on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and we are in the second week of the month, so you can now grab all the sort of free stuff on offer from Sony, Microsoft, Amazon, and whoever else you can swing it from, like Epic, for example, who right now are giving away the excellent 2D souls like Grime. And this coming Friday, they'll be serving up Train Valley 2, a puzzle game where you have to build elaborate train networks while making sure the trains don't smash into each other. This one is 93% very positive on Steam, actually, so it must be a pretty good time. Ah, uh, outside of that, not a whole lot to shout out. Nintendo just put up a demo for Pikmin 4, and that's free, I guess. One important shout is for PC Game Pass, which just brought back its $1 for one month of membership for new signups only. So this deal may be available for July only, but if it's also available in August, namely the back end of August, then you might be able to get yourself a month of membership just in time for Starfield. Starfield for a buck? Hell, that's only 1 15th the monthly cost of Fallout first. That's a steal. Seriously though, one buck for a month of Game Pass is a crazy good deal, no matter what you're planning on playing. So if you haven't jumped in yet, then this promo is a very good excuse to do so. Our feel good story for the week involves a timeless, salacious topic, forbidden love. Video games tend to play a pretty straighty 180 when it comes to carnal relations. Sure, you can romance the odd NPC here or there, but most of the time they have to at least be human. Not so in Mass Effect, of course, but even then I'd argue that the bipedal nature of Shepard's love interests all put them in the humanoid or human adjacent categories. Thankfully, that limitation is no more. And if you've ever dreamed of getting down and dirty with one of nature's four-legged creatures, there's finally a game that will let you do just that. Enter Baldur's Gate 3's lead writer, Adam Smith, who when speaking during a recent promo event for the game, put it thusly, quote, have you ever considered the joys and pleasures of sexual congress with a wild shaped druid? Because at Larian, we have and ultimately landed on the side of giving the people what they want. Tender, consensual romance with a man temporarily transformed into a grizzly bear, end quote. Think he's making it up? Thankfully, we got just a little bit of footage to prove he ain't lying. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the show for the week. In fact, that is the show for the month. This episode will be going live while I'm in the air on the way to my vacation. And you won't be hearing from me again until later this month when I upload a video that I had prepared earlier. One like equals one bon voyage. I appreciate your well wishes. I also appreciate Austin who edits these videos each and every week. And like I said, he'll be keeping the channel warm while I'm keeping myself warm in the Northern Hemisphere. The upload schedule around here is about to get a little spotty, so if you haven't already subscribed, then you may want to do that. And ding the notification bell really helps. Thank you as always for tuning in. I always appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. And as excited as I am for the holiday, I'm also really excited to get back because we have a lot of fun stuff coming in the second half of 2023. Until then, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace have generously offered to sponsor this channel for 2023. This is the fourth year running that I've had their support and I'm hugely appreciative because it's sponsors like that that help me keep the lights on around here, employing Austin and giving me the confidence to cover games however I want to cover them without being beholden to game publishers or whatever. I get to be truly independent thanks to the likes of Squarespace and that's a benefit that is never lost on me. If you're unfamiliar with Squarespace, they build websites, or more specifically, they provide a platform that allows you to build your own website really easily. Back in the day, you had to pay some company thousands of dollars to build, host, and maintain your website, but those days are long past. Now, using Squarespace's intuitive tools, you can set up a professional-looking website in minutes, adding new content to it with ease and opening up a world of opportunity. 
because a website is like the shop front of the 21st century. If you want to change careers, start a new business, turn your hobby into a vocation, or just be creative, then a website is really helpful. And there's no better place to build a website than with Squarespace. For four years running now, Squarespace have helped me turn my passion into a career. Maybe they can do the same for you. If you'd like to check it out, then visit squarespace.com. And if you want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring this channel for the fourth year running. And thanks to you for watching it.